So I was really fortunate at the start of the month to get to speak to Finn from Stochastic Instruments, who is not only a phenomenal musician, composer and teacher, but he is also the brains behind Stochastic Instruments. And they've just brought a new module out, which it is the f my favourite sequencer that I've come across so far. I, I bought the sequencer, you know, he didn't send me it or anything like that. I did buy it. I registered my interest in the module far before I ever met Finn or had the opportunity to speak to him. And right from the offset when I heard about it, I was excited. And having now had the opportunity to speak to him as well, I'm even more excited about what they've got to come in the future. But also, he's just a, f just a fantastic human. His lectures at the institution he speaks at must be so interesting because even in the hour and a half that I got to speak to him I learnt so much you know I've got no doubt that people are going to enjoy this episode of Nice Rack and I think that people will learn a lot from it as well as well as just getting a bit of an insight into what it takes to get into development of modules and manufacturing modules so with that in mind let's get stuck into it. Hello Finn. Hello. Thank you for joining me Thanks for uh, taking a break from your DIY <laughs> um, to spend some time talking to us. It's kind of you. Well, thank you for having me. It's a, a, a great honour. I'm really excited. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. Nice to we've been exchanging emails for a while, so it's nice to put a face to to the email. Yes, likewise. Yeah. So, okay, I think a good place to start before we start talking about the the module and 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 things like that. It's just to, know, to learn a little bit about you and your background, really. So if you'd just like to tell us a bit about your background first. Wow. Well, um, I, my academic background is in neuroscience, um, but my kind of, uh, my home background is, is uh, it, it, much more in music. Uh, my mother's a composer and a, a pianist and a harpsichordist, and um, my father's an engineer, so I suppose it was kind of inevitable I'd end up being a, a sound engineer or something kind of music techie. But um, I, I studied uh, cognitive neuroscience at, at, at university, and um, I, I, that's still a, a huge area of interest for me and something that features in the lecturing work uh, that I do. But um, I started working, I suppose, nearly 20 years ago now for uh, a company based down here in Plymouth where I live called DBS Music, uh, which is a, um, a recording studio set up, commercial studio, but also um, a, a, a teaching institution, so a kind of conservatoire for um, uh, sound engineering, uh, electronic music production, that kind of stuff. And we, we teach uh, everything from further education, so kind of A-level a or, or, or college equivalent, right the way through degree programs to postgraduate work. And so for the 15, 20 or so years that I've, I've worked for them, uh, synthesis has been a, a, a kind of developing uh, interest of mine going way, way back. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, we've been talking in the house recently and I found a whole stack of my school books and, uh, and I'd completely forgotten that all of my kind of geography sessions were spent doodling synthesizer at the back of the uh, the exercise book. So again, I suppose that the, uh, the seeds were sown pretty early for an interest in this, but um, what, a few things kind of really got me down this path. I mean, one of them was having a reasonably, uh, I don't want to say strict, but a kind of reasonably Catholic um, uh, uh, initial introduction to music in, in that uh, there wasn't really any, any rock or pop music in my house when I was small. Um, and it was all classical and that was wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't change that for the world, but it was there was a, a certain degree of, of, uh, of skepticism <laughs> towards uh kind of rock and pop music when i was when i was very young which i i i stress now uh, amongst my parents as, as kind of long since gone my mother's favorite band is ramstein if you can believe that um but i remember uh, a, a guy came into into school one day and he had a um a tape of jean-michel jarre it was revolution uh, not revolution a, a rendezvous and uh, we had a wonderful uh, uh, primary school music teacher, wonderful secondary school music teacher as well. Um, uh, and, and 
it was in primary school and he, he, he had this thing where if, if, if someone had a tape they wanted to play, he would put it on and we would talk about it as a, as, as a class, which is a really nice kind of way to, to introduce different music to people. Um, this guy brought in Rendezvous and I'd never heard of this composer and I, I heard the sort of opening swell and I just had no idea what made those sounds and it completely blew me sideways. So um, I begged my parents to, to, to get me a tape of this, which they did. And they played it and they thought, well, hang on, this is, this is, this is Baroque music. This isn't, it's, it's not rock and pop. It's, it's, the sounds are, are synthetic, but the, but the music is essentially a uh, 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 late 17th century, early 18th century counterpoint. And that was the sort of in that persuaded, I think particularly mum, that uh, not just kind of rock and pop music what, what wasn't, what she had been led to believe it was when she was young um but that also it could be viably instrumental and that there were kind of new sounds to be had new ways of doing music that weren't just uh writing at the at the stave or or or, uh, or, or composing at the piano or something like that not that those are in any way bad i mean i spent a lot of my time doing that you can sort of see it an organ behind me and a keyboard here, but that there are other approaches as well. So I think that that was the start of the kind of synthesis thing for me. Um, and the second major catalyst came much later, which was um, some some CPD that uh, that work let me do. A, a DBS is is, a, is a, an incredible place because it. Everybody knows a huge amount about their own particular topic. So if you want to know something, you just kind of email or, 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 or ring your, your best mate member of staff there. They'll, they'll know, there'll be a world expert in it. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So there's this constant um, atmosphere of learning that is going in all kinds of different directions. It's certainly not just, okay, we're staff, we know more than you and we, and we teach the students. We are learning from the students all the time. Uh, we hope they learn from us. And we learn from each other. So um, CPD is, is a, a kind of very strong thread at DPS and there's always encouragement to learn something new. And so I asked to do a course in electronics as a, as a BTEC um, and uh, they allocated some time and I went off and did it and I had a, a wonderful, wonderful time learning stuff. But what became immediately apparent and what now causes me to tell all of my students and kind of anyone who'll listen, look, if you're an electronic musician, one of the best things you can do, number one, learn music theory and learn an instrument, definitely. Number two, learn electronics and learn programming. Not necessarily because you're going to start making modules, and certainly I'm not competent to do that. I mean, that, 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 that is um, this, uh, my, uh, uh, my business partner, uh, Stuart McVeigh, Dr. McVeigh, who designs the circuits and builds them. He's the genius that, that, that does that. But it's the concepts that sit underneath a circuit and the way of thinking about what a circuit can do and how circuits process information and ultimately process waveforms that I found immediately sparked off 101 ideas just purely conceptually, not being taught from a musical point of view. The, the, the guy that taught us was an ex-naval uh, radar engineer. So it was, it was just electronics principles and digital principles and so forth. But almost everything he said, I, I remember thinking, it, 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 sort of sitting there writing the notes and running through the equations, goodness me, that's a fantastic idea for a module. And in fact, that was exactly how Stochastic was born. Uh, I've, I've got the, the folder over there in one of the bookcases where I just kind of scribbled down some ideas for, for what stochastic could be and how the circuit might work. At that point in analog, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 there's no way I, that would have come to me if it hadn't have been a kind of collection of the, the music side of my brain ready to pick up ideas, but then also... Uh, encountering new ideas that can can spark off that which I, I, I I'm sure is how creativity works the, the idea that you 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 introduce your concept your your bag of ideas to a completely new situation and the sparks will fly if you, with a little bit of luck and if your antenna are out because it, it, it's 
about seeing what you do from a slightly different perspective. So always, always read wider than your field, always be kind of uh, um, receptive to new ideas because that's where the magic happens. I do think, I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing story, amazing background and, and amazing how you've come to this position now. The, I, do, I do totally agree because I, I'm from a background where you know, I do play instruments and I, I was always writing and, and things. And, and I thought it was going to be an easy transition into modular. And I soon realized that I would have to learn more about the electronics, e- even though that, you know, the music elements of, of my knowledge were there. And, and so that is something that I preach as well, that if you are going to get into modular, you, you need a basic understanding of, of how these things are working. And How do you approach, well, when you play modular, because I noticed you've got a, a wonderful collection of guitars there, so I, I assume you're, you're, you're a guitarist. Do, do you find you're wearing a kind of different musical hat when you play modular compared to where you're, you're, you're playing, say, a guitar? Yeah, wholeheartedly. I mean, with, with the modular, and this is something that I've, I've been exploring more and more, and this is why your, your module now is the, is the brain of all my melodic you know, operations in, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great module and we'll come on to that, but yeah, to answer your question, definitely. The, and e- even from whether it's rhythmic or whether it's melodic, if I'm, rather than writing melodies or writing, you know, parts, I, I'm discovering them more than that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and your, your module that that's why I was I was so excited about it in the early stages when it it came out as a concept and I, I registered you know my interest way back when was because it it allows it allows you to discover melodies ra- rather than just write them. But the the yeah. other the other thing that I always say modular does really well is it incorporates maths in a way that yes. that you, you can't necessarily do you know as a human <laughs> picking up an instrument and again your module approaches that brilliantly which we'll come on to i'm sure i think i mean the, the the really important distinction for me when actually particularly when if i'm teaching musical aesthetics I mean, one of the modules that that uh, that i do is it is a kind of introduction to composition through analysis so okay here's a bunch of really cool pieces let's let's um, let's reverse engineer them and from that kind of discover uh, you know, really important underlying atoms of music, so tonality and harmony and, 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 and rhythm, but specifically and critically with um, uh, modular process. So the idea that it, in any piece of music you listen to, I think there's a balance between sound and process. So uh, if you take a, a, a like my hero, Johann Sebastian, take a piece of Bach. Uh, the the Canadian pianist Glenn Gould said that the thing about Bach is, it, I think the quote is his glorious insensitivity to recontextualization. So the idea that you can play a piece of Bach on anything, you know, it's written for the, the keyboard piece is typically written for clavichord, but that will work on harpsichord, on piano, on famously Moog synthesizer. But you know you can play on you can play on a musical saw you can play it on guitar it doesn't matter because as a uh, neuroscientist uh, uh, um, musician friend of mine once said there's probably more Bach on the page than there is of any other composer meaning that it, it's the process that is laid down there the, the internal logic the algorithmic exploration of which Bach is a, is just the master. Um, that permits it to be translated to any potential sound source and it will work. Whereas you compare that to, um, I don't know, a piece of Morton Feldman or uh, French Impressionism, Debussy or something like that, where it's, the notation is about capturing a sort of sound world. So think of Debussy with nuage, with clouds, right? So it's, it's, it's that uh, imagic kind of thing. It's a very different way of doing music to, uh, to Bach's. And I don't think, and neither is, is, is more valuable than the other, but I think it does make the point that there, there's a valid distinction between those two. 
And one of the things that interests me about modular is that because the performative elements are more, more, not entirely, but more about setting something into motion and then becoming a custodian of that thing, rather than having the complete control of your 10 fingers, you know, playing on a guitar or on a piano, then it, it allows one the headspace to be thinking in terms of process and process manipulation more than, you know, crudely worrying about hitting the right notes or worrying about um, the, uh, I don't want to say that the, the sonic aspects aren't, in, uh, aren't important, of course they are, but um, it, it's one less thing that you have to worry about. And you, as you should do, in my view, with all instruments, you play to the instrument's strength, you play idiomatically with it. So I don't think there's a bit, there's, for me at least, there's not much interest in playing a modular system in a in a more east coast kind of way in in the sense that it doesn't make sense to me to plug a keyboard in and, and play Bach on it because I want to do that I'll, I'll do that on a clavichord because it will sound better and it will I'll get more out of it and I, I would think someone listening to it would get more out of it but at the same time if you take that to its extreme and it's just setting an equation into process and then you just sort of sit back and you become an audience member. I mean, that's fine. And that's that's fun to listen to. And if you're doing a, you know, if I'm marking a essay scripts or if I'm, you know, painting walls or something, you, you can set it up as a, a kind of wind chimes sort of thing, but it's not performance in the same way. So I think what interests me is, and what I tried to do with Stochastic was to find that hinterland between something that it is process driven and is playing to the strengths of modular, but is also has that latitude to be as performative as it is uh, appropriate to be to the kind of um, uh, idiomaticity of this sort of instrument, as opposed to you know a keyboard like that or or, or a guitar or a cello. But it's nice to hear I'm not alone because it, it's I, I I was worried it was just me that thought that, but no, it's, it's it's really interesting hearing people kind of feedback about how they play it yeah well I, i'm from a live background so i i want to be able to perform and play my instruments and, and my tools and and even if it's in a, a studio environment i still want to be interacting with it and it took me a while to get used to modulation for that very reason you know because it, when everyone starts and i've been talking to some people recently who are trying to get into modular and they've been asking me to help design systems and things and the one thing that everyone always misses are, are, are good modulation sources, it, me included when I first started. And um, and I, I think it, I, I have a friend in LA who, who helped me get into modular and he, he used to say all the time, you need to be, he, he, he was discussing clouds and how you can, you know, feed CV to certain elements of clouds and it does certain things. And, and I was saying, yeah, but I want to be interacting with it. I don't want it to do all those things for, for me. And then, then when you actually, you grow your system and then you realize, well, actually I still only have two arms, but I want to, I want to get more from this or I want to introduce some controlled randomness. Then, then CV made sense to me, but, but yeah, being able to perform it is, is a huge, a huge thing for me as well. So again, it, it's great that people like you are, you know, so, so, someone with your background and I imagine that a lot of people in the module like I say you're the first person I've spoke to who who is sort of in this field and designing modules and making manufacturing modules for the show but I imagine that a lot of people who who come into that world are probably thinking Do you know what I just wish that I had something that did this and then have the you know have the knowledge like yourself to be able to <laughs> to actually do that it must be a great feeling. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure people, many different people are going to come to Modular for lots of different reasons. I mean, I, I uh, my good friend Matt Ward, a, a fabulous DJ and composer and a, a um, colleague at DBS, we, we've done lots of kind of uh, outreach programs and um, where we'll just I, I go to a festival or go to a, a, a something. Not... 
I suppose partially to to uh, to showcase what DBS does, but really just to kind of shelf some cool stuff that people might be interested in. And I, one of the things you find is that um, you'll have, let's say, playing musicians who are a, a, a bit skeptical about, look, is it a real instrument? And in every single case where that's happened, and it doesn't happen very much actually, but it's been, been a couple, you win them over very, very quickly when you say, well, look, it, it is and it isn't. It depends on what you mean by an instrument. Um, it, it, if, you, if you're thinking about it in exactly the same way as a, as a guitar, well, it, it's, that's the wrong way to think about it. But if you think about it as, I suppose, a, an embodiment or um, an enactment of a piece of music theory, or if you think about it sculpturally in terms of uh, 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 just making sounds from, from, from scratch, then it, of course it's viable. It's, it's, it's as viable as any, anything else is. Um, and then you get other people who would never even have imagined that, that there's such a thing as a modular synthesizer. They've genuinely never seen one before. And that kind of uh, blink and light and interesting kicks in and it's oh wow and, and they, they'll they'll approach it much more in a kind of look this is just a really cool lego set how do i how do i get involved in this so i, I think there are lots of different approaches that people will, will will take to an instrument like this and i think what's lovely about modular that i've i suppose i've had a sense of playing it but i've had a real sense of it actually making these things and interacting with customers is how individual it is because everybody has their own story that brings them to uh, buying a couple of little modules and then seeing how they fit together. And everyone kind of brings their own thumbprint to what they do. And whereas ordinarily that's sort of, that's the music you listen to and the influences that you have. And then if you compose how you write those into what you do, and that's, that's, that's how music has always been. And that's fantastic. But I think what's lovely about modular and computer music as well is that the role of the musician has started to expand out into the role of the instrument designer so that uh you think about say just pure software something like reactor or sonic pi or ixilang or, or, or these things allow you to build instruments from scratch so if there isn't something out there that lets you do what you want to do, you can make one. And I think that's fantastic because it's actually continuing a tradition of the interaction of composer and instrument um, that's much, much older than computers is. I mean, that goes, goes way back. Um, but it, it also means that people can come up with a wider definition of what they want music to be. So they can write songs in a standard kind of East Coast sort of way and, and just use a synthesizer sound for a standard rock and roll song or whatever they want, that's fine. But they can also create, back to that word process again, they can create an instrument that is designed to enact a process and out of that discover uh, new ways of doing composing that I, I think is enormously healthy because it's gonna to start to make them think about the, the raw elements of, of music that, that they're using. And if you think about the, um, uh, the, the standard objections to either electronic music or specifically process driven music or generative music. So where I mentioned, you know, sometimes occasionally you get a musician who's a bit cynical about that sort of stuff. Um, I like to kind of say two things about that. I mean, the, the first is something I, again, I tell my students a lot when we talk about this stuff, is that randomness isn't carelessness. It's, it's not that you're, you've run out of ideas, you know, I'll just let the machine do it. It's not that at all. It, it, it's that what you're really doing is this exactly the same thing you do when you noodle. Because neither you nor I nor Bach invented C major. You know, that we, we inherit that. And we didn't invent the the tonal system and the, and the, the the set of relationships between chords, and we didn't invent divisive rhythm and all of these other 
uh, atomic tools that we, we, we use as composers. We just inherited them and we noodled with them and eventually something kind of came out that we liked. And I'm sure you know, I mean, if, if, if you're doing standard writing, particularly if it's tonal and it's within a sort of recognized genre where, you know, it's, it's gotta be tonal, it's kind of gotta be 4-4, it's, it's, it's gotta be this set of constraints. It always feels to me when you hit upon something kind of cool, it's, it's, it's like going fossiling. Like if you walk along Charmouth Beach or Lyme Regis Beach, there are all of these pebbles around and you didn't make any of them. And what you're doing is you're looking at particular patterns that look like a um, ichthyosaur or vertebra or, or an ammonite or something like that. And you suddenly find it, it's, it's fantastic, you've got this little thing. And it's just like that. There are all of these chord progressions. There are all of these melodies which are kind of lying out there. It's like the Carl Sagan quote, you know, something, what, what is it? Somewhere out there, there's something amazing waiting to be discovered. Somewhere out there, there's an amazing juxtaposition of chord and melody that no one's come up with before. And it's totally, um, it's totally tonal, let's say. It's completely recognisable. The minute you hear it, it would be, oh, good, why didn't I think of that? And you, fantastic songwriters like Kate Bush have that ability to, to, to show you a chord sequence you thought you knew and you've never heard it like that before. And I, that's, that's just, that's wonderful. But that, that act of discovery, you, you, you said, you know, you, you're... you're it, it, it's like you're discovering melodies, you're discovering chords. That's exactly what excites me about this stuff because what we know from the neuroscience of, of creativity, particularly the neuroscience of volition and of free will, is that your brain gets there before you do. There were a series of experiments done back in, it started in the 70s by a guy called Benjamin Liebit, um, uh, the Breitschaft potential, the, the readiness potential. So crudely, your brain starts to do some activity for any quote unquote conscious choice well before, like seconds before, you yourself feel that you have made that choice. So the idea of uh, coming up with a melody really being you turns out to be quite a sticky thing to argue because it, in that sense, it was really your brain that did it rather than you. You got to find out about it a few seconds later and you got to feel that it was you. So in that sense, because we're not privy to the workings of our own brain, you know, you can't introspect about how your brain works. It's no good because you're, you're already, it's already running you. You're the software it's running. Um, this idea of creativity through discovery I think is, is, is fantastic. And what's really interesting is that many composers and creative artists intuited that relationship way before we had brain scanners to show it. So you think about Stravinsky talking about the right. He talks about the right of spring being, uh, sorry, Stravinsky says, I was the vessel through which the right flowed, which is a fabulous quote, right? Because it means that I, I just didn't have anything to do with it. It just kind of, came out of me um i mean actual fact that's true then, then he's going to let on actually because the opening bassoon line is is a is a russian folk tune that he's just slowed down but again you know that's that's recontextualizing something but yeah i think all creativity is in effect dealing with a found object it's just where that found object came and it's nearly always the the interaction of your brain and the context it finds itself in, which, which in our kind of shared musical heritage is uh, tonal harmony, right? And, and divisive rhythm. And we just, when you come up with that great lit, you've just sort of discovered it because it was, it was going to happen if you noodle around enough because we play lots, we listen lots, and that's what happens when things come together. So if, if my little module can, um, can facilitate that and can, present options to people then you know that's fantastic and i'm i'm absolutely thrilled to bits about that yeah me too so thank you thanks again for it so but yeah so i guess just to bring it back onto the module then because obviously you know to look at it, it looks like the omsonic stuff that because originally when i uh, you know when i saw this it was under the the omsonic brand and you know, I've got the um, the hi hat module 
from there. But I think because you you did have a lot to do with those as well, did you? Because I'm sure I saw your name floating around even where you back did. Then. Not with a hi hat module. That's entirely Fen's. Uh, so, um, Fen, who runs on Sonic, uh, was uh, my student a few years ago on the uh, the B Tech that we teach at DBS Music, and then subsequently uh, the uh, the degree that that I also teach on. And um, one of the the things that I, I kind of mentioned that, that that DBS is very much about being a, a, a commercial studio and, uh, and all staff members doing music as well as teaching music. And I think that's really important because um, music's one of those, those things where you, you've kind of got to be doing it, I think, to be really able to give a, a, a perspective to the, to the next generation on what it's like to be a musician, how, how kind of wonderful but chaotic and spontaneous and all of those wonderful things that, 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 that being a musician is. Um, and so we've always had a kind of work ethic of, yes, we're all doing things, but also we're, we're making contacts with industry. Uh, as the modular synthesis aspect of my work as a lecturer kind of grew and grew, uh, together with my friend Matt and uh, another good friend, Chris Pratt, uh, another amazing, DJ, uh, performer, composer. Um, we came up with the idea of creating something called the Modular Research Group. So essentially, I, I always describe it as, a, as a, a club with a, a very exclusive club with open membership. So anybody who's got a good idea, be it staff, students, whoever can kind of come to us and we'll, we'll sort of look at it and we'll see, look, is, is this viable? Can we make something with this? And so Fenn had already started on Sonic, um, I, I think when he was still an undergraduate or, or maybe even before. So he was already designing um, beautifully done, um, but quite conventional East Coast kind of stuff. So uh, beautiful filters, beautiful oscillators, that, that kind of thing. Um, when I originally came up with the idea for Stochastic, which was 2009, when I did this electronics course, uh, it wasn't really viable at that point to, to put it in, into production because the, the, the rapid turnaround, um, small scale fabrication stuff that, that, that you can do now 10 years later, I mean, it wasn't really so much of a thing then. And certainly I didn't know enough about it to even know how to get started with that. But um, at some point in whenever it was 2017, 2018, um, where it became viable to do that, um, sort of as part of bringing the MRG into life and sort of just because Fen was there and he knew how to do this stuff, I started talking about, look, is this something that is viable to do? He said, yes, it is. So Fen did the initial circuit design and the faceplate design. And we then needed a, a, a firmware programmer to, to actually run it on the chip because the original design that, that, that I had done just on paper whatever it was 11 years ago, uh, you could probably build stochastic in analog, but I don't, you know, it would be huge. And uh, it, 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 particularly to do all of the, the secondary and tertiary functions, it would be enormous. So it's not really viable. So um, I spent a bit of time kind of searching around for a firmware uh, designer and, and ended up finding uh, a Stuart who is just incredible. Um, Stuart doesn't come from a musical background at all. Um, but kind of got what the project was about and how to implement it. I, I'd, I'd written a, a, a software implication, a implementation in Python in about 2014. So um, I, was I kind of gave uh, Stuart that code. But the initial conversation I had with him was just uh, via telephone from, I think I was, I was at, on holiday somewhere, I was a silly, I think. I, 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 I was just talking to him for about an hour on the phone and he absolutely got what it was about so quickly, picked up all of the sort of the musical context around it incredibly quickly, very, very impressive. By the time I got back from holiday, he'd already done version one of the firmware, which did all of the primary functions, not the secondary tertiary stuff, but just the primary functions. So at that point, we, we had something that we knew was pretty cool. Um, but as we 
went into production, I think really we just hadn't anticipated what the demand was, how interested people would be in it. Um, I had initially thought that this is quite a fringe um, sort of second or third sequencer stroke random source that someone who had um, fairly standard sequences might have as an add-on. To my delight, many people are buying it as a, as a, a first sequencer um, because you know, it's very easy to use and it generates stuff and it's compact and it's got four tracks and, and, and so forth. So, I mean, that's amazing to hear. And I, I didn't think for, for a million years people would be, would be using it like that, but they have. And I think really it was just more people wanted one than, than Fen could churn out in the time that we had. Um, and so at some point towards the end of 2020, uh, where it became apparent that, you know, really things weren't moving as fast as any of us wanted to, I, 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 I chatted to Fen and it, 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 he was absolutely fine with it. Um, he thought it was the best idea too. So at that point, that's where Stuart and I set up stochastic instruments as a, as a kind of separate thing. So initially Stuart was just in on, on a kind of straight uh, uh, contract just to do the firmware and that, that was it. Um, but then I went back to him and said, look, what, what do you think about us setting up? Because I think, you know, Fen just doesn't have the time to do this to meet the demand. And, and, and over a very busy Christmas holiday um, in between kind of cramming in nut roast and opening presents and things, um, we'd set up the company, done the website, done a logo design. Stuart incredibly had redesigned all of the hardware and all of the firmware again for the new hardware so that it was able to be skiff friendly, very compact and designed for um, outsourced manufacture rather than in. I, mean, I think it was one of the issues with, with Fen is Fen builds all of his own stuff. Um, and so he's doing all of the surface mount, all of the wave flow and all of the through hole. Whereas, um, Stuart's approach was to, was to outsource that so that we we had something that was that was more scalable. And then over 2021, it's just been fulfilling the Omsonic waiting list where you know that you were on and, and, and many others were on. And we're really, really close to finishing that now. Really close to finishing, which is which is kind of exciting as well. Um, but you were mentioning about the the, the panel design. Um, Fen's artwork is, is, is absolutely beautiful, I think, as, as, as everybody knows. And um, it was so associated with the module that we kind of thought, well, look, we could redesign it and just make it kind of a stochastic faceplate. Sorry, sorry, stochastic instruments faceplate, I should say. But, um, you know, that, that would be a real shame because it, 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 it's associated with uh, being initially an Omsonic product, even though it, it, it isn't anymore. And so in sort of deference to what Fenn brought to it and, and the incredible job he did with the artwork, we retained that under license. So if you look on the back, it sort of says that, you know, artwork by, by Omsonic under license. Um, and I just tweaked it slightly. We, we used a kind of whiter gold uh, relief um, so that it's, it's easy to tell if you've got an Omsonic one or a stochastic or an SI one. Um, and we did, of course, we did the black panels and change the logo and I put on the the secondary and tertiary functions on there in <laughs> admittedly quite small writing but because there they're, there are a couple of layers there so just until you learn where the second functions are if you need to check it's on the panel um but yeah that that's essentially how how it got there how it came to be and um it's now kind of Stuart and, and, and me Stuart does all of the the design work and and the the build work although we're now beginning to outset oh, I, I say all the build work, all of the, the through hole completion build work although we're beginning to outsource that as well so that we can we can ramp up again um, for, for scalability and then um, it's a question of doing the huge list of, of, of ideas that, that that I kind of had over the last 10 years now having got tentatively close to, to at least clearing the, the waiting list, or the, shall I say waiting list one, <laughs> the, the, the on-sonic ones. Yeah, I, I mean, it must, because you must have a lot of ideas in the bag, and, and I think that seeing the reaction to this, you must be really excited about, you know, some of the other things you've, <laughs> you've, you've got. I'm, I'm absolutely busting to tell 
people what, what we're what we're planning. I mean, I can't yet, but we're 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 very close to having a proto of something that I think is going to be enormously exciting. Um, and we need to go through beta with that. And again, one of the thing about DBS is is that we've got a whole staff and a whole student cohort who can do our beta testing for us. And you know, that's great for us because um, students are going to see things. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm in my mid forties, but you know, what do I know? I'm I'm over the hill now. Uh, you know, they're they're bristling with ideas and 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 they're coming from musical backgrounds and context that, that that I just don't have. So they're going to bring things to beta that I I would never have seen, which is which is wonderful. But also they love it too because it gives them a taste of 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 what that kind of extended brief of being a composer is now. You know, you're not you. We don't have that luxurious compartmentalization that we we had in the 70s where you're a composer and you're just a composer and then you go to the, the the recording studio which has got just a mixed engineer and just a tape op and so and, and then it goes off to just a mastering engineer everybody does everything now so if we're able to introduce students to the idea of yeah fine you're writing your tracks but you're also performing them programming them and look someone might ask you to endorse a product or beta test a product and then you get to use that on your track and that's just that's how it works now i think they find enormous value from that too so um we'll yes we'll do uh, alpha between stuart myself and a couple of uh, probably matt and chris and and and, uh, and friends and colleagues of ours and then we'll probably run beta amongst the students um and then i don't know when that's going when it's going to hit the market i i i, I really want to say latter half of this year. I don't know if that's feasible. It depends on how long the firmware takes, but um, it, it, it should be tremendously exciting. I, I'm certainly excited. I, I think that another thing with, with this particular module is it, it's the first of its kind, if, I, if I'm right in, in saying. I think uh, Vermona kind of got the bar. I think you beat them to it, if, I, if I'm right in saying. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I... I honestly, we didn't know about the Vermona one until the 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 well into the production and design of the, of, of the actual module, let alone the um, uh, the idea that I had, you know, ten years ago. Um, so it's certainly in in terms of an implementation of the core idea, which was uh, the notion that a, a standard Moog style sequencer the transition from step to step is the thing that is is fixed and what is parameterized so that i.e the thing that you 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 fiddle with is is the level of each step so what occurred to me uh sitting down learning about uh logic theory and and, and so forth was that you could actually flip that you you could parameterize the transitions you know which step you jump to and you could fix what the pitches were. So you just literally turn the thing on its on its head. That that was the 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 the, the interesting insight that, that that I think I was able to have. Um, so uh, I don't know of anything that that did that before two thousand and nine, certainly. And then the the actual implementation of that in um, uh, in software in Python, which I did. At, I can't remember what it was, but maybe a couple of years later, um, and that was that was just written purely in Python, ran on a Raspberry Pi, and was under um, uh, Draybank control. You remember that? I think I've got it over here somewhere. No, I've lost it. Um, uh, so uh, Chris Pratt lent me uh, his dope for Draybank. So it's sixty-four knobs, uh, all assigned to, to, to MIDI CC channels. So um, I essentially just kind of printed out the 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 uh, uh, the knob labels, so C, C sharp, D, D sharp, and so forth, uh, and then the um, the durations and uh, the other functions that it did. Assigned each one of those to a knob, and wrote the algorithm that would deal with the, if you like, the shared probability between those. And I had that running on whatever MIDI device you wanted to, to plug it into. So I think I was running it on a called something either called Triton or something and I was immediately struck then that look it's a viable idea it's not just a, a sort of plinky plonky thing it's a, I 
like you know wind chimes where it, it'll or or um uh um sample and hold noise where it's 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 beautiful for sort of five seconds and then because it's statistically stable it just becomes boring so you look at any short period of time and it's interesting because you've got the notes going everywhere and you can you can quantize it so it's tonal or, or do whatever you you want with it but because every note is equiprobable it never actually gets anywhere and it therefore becomes kind of boring kind of quickly whereas the, the idea of this was that you could not only skew the probabilities into a tonal space but modify that tonal space in performance so you can uh, modulate in in the the classical sense of, of, of the term between keys or or or, or between um, common chords in a in a um, a shared key. Um, so I think it was pretty clear that I I got something that was at the very least interesting to me with that first implementation. Of course, there was a long time between that and actually making the module, but. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know of anything that, that, that had done it before um, uh, the, the the initial idea and then the Python idea. Um, I don't know who was uh, uh, who was first to market. I think I think we were first to first to market. I think I don't know, but um, it, it's <laughs> what's nice actually is that people are having those kinds of ideas, so that you're not existing in a um, in isolation from, 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 from everyone else. So that I think that because of that process idea we were talking about, this, this way of treating pitches, I, I don't want to kind of sound too cold by, by calling them data, um, but certainly the, an approach to dealing with pitches and rhythms and harmony that uh, lets the the music theory speak for itself. Should we should we put it like that? Again, I mean, one of the reasons why, why Bach is such a hero is that you never get the sense that Bach is um, doing it for him. So there's there's it, it, it's not that the spotlight is on him. What he's doing is 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 almost sort of showing you, look, this is what music can do. In fact, he even says this, he even says, look, playing the keyboard is easy. You just to kind of press the right keys in the right order. And so it's like you have this incredible tool that is sitting there that is music theory, whatever theory that is. I mean, you know, I, that doesn't have to be Western harmonic theory. It can be, you know, any uh, organizational principle for sound. Just because of the way we're wired, because of how much of our brain responds to music. I mean, you know, famously put someone in a brain scanner when they listen to music and their whole brain lights up like a Christmas tree. And there's, there's virtually nothing else that does that. Um, you've only got to have a driver, something that is going to allow that music theory to express itself and something amazing is going to happen. So the fact that lots of us are thinking along those lines in modular i think is is, is wonderful so um yeah I'm, I'm i'm thrilled to bits that it's it's a thing that modular can do that and that allows us to do that and that it's seen as viable it's seen as respectable music which of course it is um but that, that people are um sensitive to and accepting of the fact that these instruments can do that and provided there is enough of the uh, uh, the musicianship in how you steer that then it can be more than just a process that sits there or expensive wind chimes again to, to sort of bring it back to, to Jean-Michel Jarre there's a beautiful quote of, of his where he says the, the more complex the technology the more vital the hand of the musician which I think is a wonderful quote um, and I, I hope that's the kind of ethos of the the sort of performative process idea that that we're trying to do with with a, a, a module like this. Definitely, I think you you used a 
you use the word viable there, which is something that I thought as well, and especially from from a marketing perspective. If you know, if things are too different, people are terrified of them, and and like you say, if 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 if, if multiple people are on the same wavelength, and it, it just shows that it is viable. And I think you know the the other the other big thing is hitting the market at the right time, which I think you you're doing, and because there's there's enough modules now where you know like the bloom for example that's exploring with you know with chance and and the electron devices work on chat and chance is a bit of a buzzword around the um, surrounding electronic music at the minute and so you've you've hit the market at a really good time for me as well but but another thing that before we just take a look at the module another thing that i loved about it is is the layout of it and different to say a bloom where it is set to fixed scales Mm-hmm. you know and you can't don't get me wrong you can you know with certain modules like that you can adjust them can't you and program your own scales but it, it's the immediacy of being able to 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 do that with your module and also the the other side of it is it, it does make you a better musician because if you want it to be musical it it benefits you to learn those skills um so especially people with in modular and electronic music, not, not a lot of them have come from a musical background always, or not necessarily not a lot of them, but not everyone's come from a musical background, which is great in itself and probably produces some really interesting results in itself. Oh, but, absolutely. But yeah, it, but, but, but it'll, it, you know, it, it certainly encourages you to, to learn a bit of the music theory, which never goes amiss, does it? So I, mean, I hope so. I, I, I think, a couple of things to say there. I mean, first, the, yes, I think chance is, is a, a, a big thing in Euro right now. But it's a chance, of course, is nothing new in music. I mean, we, we have examples before Mozart, actually, of um, probabilistic music. I mean, Mozart probably most famously with the uh, musicalist Wolfenspiel. So the, the, uh, this series of little minuets that, where you would select bars by dice rolls and whichever way they would combine you would get a, 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 a viable piece out of it and he wasn't the first to do that but um of course through John Cage uh, and others the idea of um uh chance-based processes so again that process word so um Michael Nyman's uh, seminal text experimental music Cage and Beyond which is is you know, that's a Bible. Anybody should read that because uh, anyone with with an interest in uh, process music of all of the different things that can mean, from kind of Reichian minimalism to John K. J. Literacy to Cornelius Cardew kind of happenings, all of those things, they're all documented in that text, and it's a fabulous, fabulous text. So you know, Michael Nyman not only being a a, a hero composer. Um, that work probably more than any other is written right at the heart of musicians again doing actually being part of that scene so that's a, a really inspirational text if, if people don't know it uh, um, but I think that the the technology lets us implement chance in a, a, a really user-friendly kind of way and it's open-ended. I think this is a, a, another really critical aspect to uh, to modular synthesis, as opposed to any other kind of synthesis, like you know, synthesize a keyboard like this, um, is that it's it's essentially atomic. So that if if you think about um, in the classic mono synth, like, you know, MS Twenty, my, probably my favourite synthesizer. Um, even though it's it's a semi-modular synthesizer, the layout is very much that kind of East Coast. Uh, uh, you know, VCO, VCA, VCA envelope. And that leads you to, leads you down the, 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 the garden path to a certain extent that an oscillator can only be an oscillator and a filter can only be a filter and an amplifier can only be an amplifier. And an envelope generally can just be an envelope generator. Whereas actually, again, that electronics idea, you look at them, they're really all the, exactly the same thing with very, very slight differences in, in the way that the circuit is designed. And so that if you see um, modular synthesis as something that is, is qualitatively different, it's a different kind of thing because it's a different kind of cognitive approach you bring to it, 
than just as an ordinary, quote unquote, ordinary kind of keyboard. Suddenly your envelope generator can be uh, an oscillator and you know you, you can patch its output back into its import. You can do all of these, these, these things and you start to see your modules as little atoms that can be within limits, whatever you want them to be. Uh, that's a very powerful idea because it means that the elegantly implemented chance that you have with with you know random based modules or stochastic or, or, or whatever can cause things to happen that aren't just pitch and of course most of the way that you're going to use a, a, a module like stochastic is to produce melody and and and, and, and harmony if you've got a, a a harmonic module like i mean i use the um the cubic chord v2 which i adore i think it's a wonderful wonderful module but you know you can you could you can use stochastic to to make anything happen under probabilistic control it doesn't have to be just pitch events um so yeah i think that's that's very useful but also we were mentioning about uh music theory um thinking about music theory in the same kind of way thinking about it as not just the thing you're supposed to learn because your music teacher tells you that you should but thinking of it as a, as a software so the the composers that, that that i'll teach on let's say our first year um electronic music production course they'll be they'll already have done a lot of composing and they, they're they're really used to coming up with fantastic beats and fantastic melodies uh in their computer but they 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 haven't necessarily come from a playing tradition or a standard grades ABRSM kind of tradition or anything like that. And maybe they don't listen to a lot of classical music or, 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 or any of that. And that's all fine. It's just a case of persuading them that look, we're going to do this thing called music theory, but we're not going to do it out of a sense of kind of um, deference. And it's, it's not sort of, we're not trying to do reproduction antiques. We're doing it because it's enormously powerful and it can do things for you that just downloading another bit of cracked software can't do. So if you view it as a toolkit software, suddenly what it does is where you had a sort of spotlight down on the bit of music that, that you knew about, suddenly that spotlight widens out and you see all of this territory either side of it. And there are things that you can do. There, there's a, you know, if you don't want to get too pretentious about it, there's a sort of a, a possibility space that opens and that idea about creativity coming from you doing what you do, but in a different context, which I've heard lots of composers talk about. I mean, uh, uh, that was, um, those words are actually Brian Fernihan, um, the, 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 um, uh, the so-called new complexity composer, a horrible term. My, my, my com composition teacher was, I was lucky enough to have Michael Finnessy as, as a teacher, who I think is one of our, our you know, greatest composers that, Britain has ever produced ever and I'm including sort of Purcell and, and Tippett in that so I was enormously lucky to study with Finnessy um, and he would talk about the same kinds of ideas it, 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 it's about you, you you react to something differently if you bring a new context to it so even I remember once he, he said look even the way you notate something so you can have the same site boom boom if you notate that as two crotchets, you'll react to it differently to if you notate as, I don't know, some sort of nested tuplet or something. You want to do different things with it. So I think the value of learning, should we say a theory, not theory, because that, that's a bit kind of, you know, hero worship. But if we just say a, 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 some sort of organisational principle is that it gives you something to push against. It gives you a context that you can you can reject, right? And that's perfectly viable. Punk did that and they did it brilliantly. Or you can take the bits that you like and do what you want with them. And that's what composers have always done. And then if you bring that again into another context like chance or probability, you can, you can get those two worlds to collide in a way. And suddenly the specifics of what you're doing because you've had lots of different places to pick from, that little bit of theory over there and that module over there and that rhythm I like and that sample, suddenly that's so unique 
a confluence of influences and events that that's you that's your unique little thumbprint and that's what that's what composing is that's wonderful it's really funny that you should say that. yeah they, when when i first the first band that i was in because i write a lot with my best friend and we've wrote together for a lot of years now and he's from a classical background and 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 i'm not i'm self-taught so some some of our best work came from our biggest arguments where he would say musically that doesn't work and i would say but it sounds great and he'd say yeah but it doesn't work and we'd go through you know we'd go around in circles around that and then compromise and inevitably would would create something genius you know <laughs> it was yeah so it's funny that you should say that it's not it's nice to hear that that's a thing and and uh now now you, there's a well, prescription or a description theory well, i mean well in uh, the sense that you know there's that there's the sort of grades way of doing it whereas like, that's the right answer and then there's the I think the the more compositional way of thinking about it, which is that the the theory never came first. Composers just did what composers did, and then musicologists wrote after the fact and found a description of what composers were doing that is elegant and lets you explain what they were doing in in a reasonably succinct way. But it's not like the law. In, 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 in capital letters. It's just something that, that again, gives you something to, to, to push against. Yeah, I could, I could have done with you there 10 years ago when we were having these arguments. And, and <laughs> the, yeah, the, no, I, I totally agree. And for me, you see, it was always that, that I would, I would do something that to my ear I was happy with. And then mm -hmm. I would see if it was a thing. And then, you know, whereas he would, he would have, a set of principles that he would initially start with and and he would noodle like you said until until he found something so i think that you know you can approach it either way and and like you say when when those two worlds sort of intertwine and start to battle each other a little bit that's when something unique can happen and yes that was yes. our case definitely that, that happened in our case for sure yeah i think also being <sighs> that curious thing of um knowing when to switch off your knowledge. Um, a, a, another really good composer friend of mine, Nicola Kojibashi, the, the Macedonian composer, he, he said something wonderful to me once. He said, uh, composition is, is the art of being simultaneously smart and dumb. And I think that's dead right. So it, if, if you think of like Beethoven five, ba 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 um, that's such a stupid idea, right? ba 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 but look at what he does with it for, for 18 minutes of incandescent genius. So it's about having a material that you know, anyone could do that. I could have done that. Of course, you couldn't because you've got to come up with the idea and then you've got to make it work. But the rub is that sometimes that generative phase, the coming up with the idea, can actually be stifled by knowing too much. Because coming up with something is all about anything being, I don't want to say anything being possible because it, creativity cannot exist without constraint, but you, you, your antenna have to be out and you have to be sort of open to anything. Anything can be a possibility and you're, oh, let's, let's go with that, let's, let's follow that. But then comes what Brian Eno, I think, calls the, the editorial phase of creativity where you've got the thing and now you've got to start sandpapering it to, to actually make it work. And that's when you sort of switch on the theory or you switch on the experience. But it's, it's, it's a real knack. It's a re that's the sort of, that's the composer's sort of cross to bear that, that, that one has to be able to switch that on and off when it's needed. Otherwise, you know, if, it, if it's only expertise, then you're just, all you're gonna do is, is recreate theory. But then if it's only sort of generative stuff, it's never going to get past ba 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 ba. It's never actually going to become that 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 incredible thing. That, that's a really good way of looking at it. I like I really like that. And I think that yeah, I think when when I first got into modular and I started speaking to other modular musicians to ask how how they because certain things I couldn't 
comprehended. I couldn't get my head around. For, firstly, I, I looked at it and I thought, well, how do I know? How do I get everything to to be in tune? And then when I spoke to people, people just said, oh, we don't worry about that. And and that blew my mind. And then when I when I wanted to know what BPM I was playing in, and, and people said, oh, we don't worry about that. And, and my head wanted to explode for, because, because of my background. And so I, I think that I, I, I really admire people that can go into it and just think, well, you know, whatever the tuning is when I turn it on, depending on the you know how warm or cold my oscillator is and, and all the rest of it that, that I really admire that it's not something that I can necessarily do I always used to think that's all well and good until you send it to somebody to remix and then they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna be absolutely fuming when, you, <laughs> when, when it's in some <laughs> monotonal scale that they, <laughs> so but but yeah I think some of that actually is the how loose the Eurorack standard act is I mean certainly speaking with Stuart um, who who of course is you know as, as a as a pure electronic engineer is, is absolutely coming from a tradition of you know a standard is a standard is a standard and it's fixed and I had to sort of sheepishly explain to him that well that these bits are reasonably common amongst users but this bit is completely up for grabs and 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 it is not standardized and and so uh yeah i i know but there actually being a playing musician is 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 useful as opposed to let's say a dj so a dj is gonna have an incredible ear for bpm vastly better than than than, than mine is and I, I probably better than, than than a lot of classical musicians actually who would be able to say well that's Presto or, or Andante or whatever, but a, a DJ is, is, is uh, all of the DJs either of them are very very good at saying, well, that's 123 or whatever. And I don't know how the hell they do that. I suppose it's like perfect pitch, I guess. But um, the tuning aspect. So if you sing in choirs or you play non-fretted instruments, certainly you know you 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 you, you play non-keyboard instruments. Then having to listen when you play and adjust tuning is really important. So, uh, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I've done this loads of times playing live where you, you, you've got something and you've done all your homework and you've got this fantastic, you hope, set planned out. And in, performati- in performance, you, you, you get a bit animated and you nudge the tuning on an oscillator or something. It's, oh, Christ, that's gone out. So, you've got to be quite quick with a good ear to retune that quickly because you don't you just don't have time to repatch and put it into a tuner or get a tuner out you just have to know what key you're in and you have to move it so in in that respect i think it's actually quite similar to to, to playing more conventional instruments actually and again if it's making people listen and be pitch aware then that's not necessarily a bad thing but also i mean like i think kind of good practice as well so I don't teach very much uh, further education stuff anymore. But I mean, certainly when I did, a, a lot of the, the first month or so, when we had people who'd never been in the studio before, maybe they, they, they were they're vaguely aware they liked music, but they'd never really thought it was something that, that, that they even could do. A lot of it is sort of saying, look, we're going to teach you how to do rock and roll, but I'm afraid the first couple of weeks are not going to be very rock and roll because it's just really simple stuff like, which order did you switch the instrument mixer speakers on how do you coil a speaker cable how do you you know plug a mic in so you don't destroy all of that stuff how do you set up a mic stand that so really procedural stuff i don't think is necessarily a bad idea to teach so just as as instrumentalists we've got to sit down and practice our scales otherwise our fingers don't work anymore it's not a very musical thing to do but it's a it's a muscular thing that you need because sometimes you have to play faster than others. Well, similarly, developing workflows for synchronization, tuning, um, module layout, so that you, you're minimizing the chances of accidentally nudging a tuning knob or something like that. Practicing retuning under pressure if something goes wrong. Practicing resynchronizing under pressure if something goes wrong. All of those actually, I think, are really good skills to develop as a, as a modular musician. And 
are going to make you um, conversant with tra more traditional musicians as well, which I think is a very good thing because we're already seeing collaborations between modular musicians and, and um, uh, uh, conventional instrumental. I mean, I, you know, it's something I do. Um, several of my customers have, have sort of sent uh, uh, videos of them interacting with, with this and, 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 a, and a played instrument at the same time, and that's fantastic. So working up workflows where the modular world can be easily interfaced with the standard instrumental world. I, I, again, I think that's something which is, is really being made up as we go along, actually, because we do, that thing of the Eurorack standard being quite loose, it's, it's because it's so young, right? I mean, Eurorack is, 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 what, 20 years old, something like that? Um, it's, it's, it's not an old, it's, it's, it's half the age of MIDI, and you know, MIDI really is a proper standard, digital standard. Eurorack is a sort of loose collection of agreements, really. And so I, I think as we, we develop the whole field, all of us, players and, and, and composers and, and, and makers, some of those processes will start to be just accepted practice. It is important. I think, like, whether you're in the modular world or whether, you, you know, like when we toured and stuff, you, we have to remember as well that those that muscle memory and those processes have to become really ingrained in you because normally you'll be doing them after five or six pints as well. So they, they have to be, uh, they, you do need those building blocks, like you say, before you, and, and just that etiquette as well. I think that we did a lot better as a band because we, when we went to venues, you know, we didn't just arrive at the mic stands and we were, you know, we were sort of um, mindful of other people's gear and equipment and, and things like really? that. And, and so, yeah, that, that's really important to teach. And it isn't very rock and roll, but, you know, it so, so much of the industry isn't what people think it's going to be anyway. So <laughs> it's important to do with those things, definitely. And as you say, if, if you've got to think about it, it's all you're done for. It's already too late. The minute you look at your fingers and you go, "How on earth am I doing that?" and you're done for. That's, you know, it has, you have to be so. You have to have done it so often that you don't have to think about it. Definitely. Okay, so just uh, I think the thing to finish off on would be would be to look at the module, the pa you know the panel specifically, what everything does, what everything's doing for people who might be interested in the module. Obviously. We're going to hear a little bit of it, which is really good. I, I'm going to, over the next few weeks, people who follow me will see more and more of it anyway, because, like I say, it's become the uh, it's become the brain of the melodic element of my system. So everything I, I do will, will include it. So And it probably is going to benefit me, and I'm probably going to learn more from watching you use it than from the manual, even though the manual is, is really easy to follow. Uh, so, well, yeah. I, I tried, I, we actually beta tested the manual as well, because it, it, as you said, it is a sort of new concept. So I, I wanted to explain as much as I could about it and how it works and why it works the way it works. But at the same time, of course, not be too, too long winded about it. So I hope it made sense. Um, but please ask questions if, if there was anything that, was, that, 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 that wasn't too clear. No, it was, it, I think it's, it's spot on and it, and it is clear, definitely. Um, like you say, it's 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 a complex sort of idea in itself, but but you've managed to lay it out in a way that's really accessible. So I think that people will, people can just set this module up and patch it up, and and they'll be good to go really without. And so I mean, I think key was was mimicking that note layout. So as as a performer, even even if you're not a pianist, you, you know what that black and white key layout is and there, there, there is some degree of familiarity be that through the piano roll display or it's it's just a a site that even non-musicians are just familiar with that layout that, so that's one of the things that sold me on it and and again going back to when you are playing and performing and and having something a process again that that you're familiar with that you don't have to think about and that you know mm -hmm. that layout is one of those those things that you're you know that you've 
that you sort of mentioned a second ago where you can you can look at that and you know where all the notes are without having to read the panel. And and I think that was a really a clever move to, to lay out like that. Excellent. Well, should we have a look at it then? Yeah, definitely. So if I reset and if we bring all of these down, and we'll just look at, say, channel one, right? Uh, I've got it externally clocked at the moment. So we can hear something there. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take off any sort of um, uh, delay stuff. So we're only really hearing the, uh, the notes that we want. Otherwise, it'll be a bit confusing. Um, the first thing to say is that when it's it's it started, but all of the faders are down, it's it's in what you might want to call kind of standard, uh, uh, sorry, standby mode. So uh, it knows that you you don't want anything because all of the probabilities are back. But if I start to dial something in, it also knows that how much I dial in is going to be the mixture of notes and rests. So although it's only sixteenths which are selected in the vertical column here, which are the durations. We're not hearing constant pulsing 16ths because it's not all the way up. If I do that, that's what I get. So I can have this, what we called uh, automatic density mode by, by not pushing them up all the, all the way. So it, it's, it's tempting, I suppose, to just go, okay, well, I wanna be in C minor, so I'm just gonna do all of that, but then, that's only doing the kind of uh, um, sample and hold through a, a quantizer thing. So it's not actually that interesting. Where I wanted to take this in terms of uh, that performative element, that playing element, is the fact that, well, no, look, these aren't switches, these are sliders. So actually what I want to be able to do is nuance this a little bit by saying, well, Statistically speaking, being in C means that there are more Cs than anything else. But to make it a little bit more interesting, and a bit, even if we only keep in C minor, I just have to push, if you like, the structurally important notes of C minor up a little bit. And if I keep them back far enough, there's still going to be a little bit of space in there. For, uh, uh, for rests and I can I can privilege the the triad let's say by doing that and now I've got something which is not just a, a equiprobable flat selection of the notes I've got something which is is sort of lent to where, to where I want it. I could make it less triadic actually, which might be a bit more interesting. Maybe if I put the non-triadic notes in, so that's the not the notes that make the triad of the scale, which in C minor would be uh, C, well, it's marked D sharp because I didn't have enough room to say D sharp stroke E flat, so it's spelled wrong. But if you think of that as E flat rather than D sharp. There we go, that's probably a little bit more interesting. No. Um, I'm going to dial in a little bit of uh, different duration now. So it defaults into um, zero octave and 16th. So essentially, you can think of those as having a 100% share of the probability when you before you do anything. And what you're doing when you dial in other ones is essentially you're taking away some of that share. So I've got a little kind of rhythm going there. We'll put in some quarters as well. And then, of course, to make this much more interesting, we want to have some sense of um, uh, pitch space, so or registration, if you like, so low and high versions of those. So if we just have Cs for a second, if I do that, Already, that's more interesting because it's occupying different uh, different pitch spaces. And if I put a bit of fairy dust on that, that's going to sound okay. Now, just opening up those octaves 
is going to allow your ear to, in effect, construct the music because you're going to hear the lower notes as harmony, you know, harmonic context, and the upper notes as um, as the quote-unquote melody. So, although it's quite pontalistic at the moment, I could maybe take those really extreme ones out and just have it on the middle ones. So there's a start, and then we haven't got any of the secondary functions or anything in there. Um, but maybe if we start now to think about one of the simplest secondary functions there. I'll kind of illustrate how I see this in, in a sort of performative sense. So if I just leave the octaves to uh, probabilistic selection, then it, it will just sit there doing this um, yeah, kind of pontalistic thing, which again is very pretty, but it's still ultimately statistically stable. It's statistically stable for longer, so it's not boring for, let's say, five seconds as, as, a, as a sample and hold random noise thing would be. But after a minute or so, it's gonna be like, okay, I know what this is doing. Man. To really play it, rather than just set it in motion, we can use the individual note octaves. So the idea there, let's just go back to C. So I'm just going to have constant Cs. If I hold down loop and I move just the C slider, and I drop that down like that, what that does is offsets just the Cs in octaves. And you can see the little minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two along the side there. The idea of that is that we hear music as given a harmonic context by the lowest note that is there. So, you know, if, 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 uh, if you guys at home know about uh, chord theory, we know that um, if you take a, a chord like uh, C minor, C, E flat, G, what we call the inversion that that chord is in is defined by the lowest note that is there. So if we put the, the C at the bottom, that's in its root position. If we put the E flat at the bottom, it's in its first inversion, you put the G at the bottom, it's in its second inversion. But if you take that idea further, it means that the lowest pitch that you're hear, hearing is in effect setting the harmony. It is basically telling you which chord you're on, even though you're not listening to a chord, you're listening to individual notes. Now, if you take that idea, you can really run with it. Because what I'm going to do is put in exactly my kind of relative C minor probabilities here. And I'm going to just speed it up a little bit. So we're going to go with uh, 16ths and 8ths. And a little bit of octave movement there we go now we're going to steer the harmony of this just by dropping individual notes but only that individual note so at the moment it's the c's which are low i can modulate to the a flat so the the the, the, the um kind of characteristic minor harmony thing of uh chord one minor chord seven major, chord six major, which is sort of like, you know, every minor key pop tune, let's say. Let's bring the C's back. C's back are at zero. Now I'm gonna to go to the A flat. And it doesn't even have to turn up that often. Just because it's consistently lower, and because we're used to listening to music that does this, your brain immediately hits what the composer is trying to do harmonically. Put a little bit more fairy dust on. Maybe put a cheeky... So I'm now in, let's say, B flat. I can now go to the relative major, so we've got an E flat. We've got a chord four minor, so that's F minor.
back to A flat. B flat. And then back to the root. Okay, did, did that kind of make sense? Yeah, sounds amazing. Sounds really, really cool. I'm just excited. I just keep looking over at man now and I'm just I've got it patched up and I just can't wait to get <laughs> to get stuck into it. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, it makes it makes it really play, but the, the idea of composition is is something that I've had to come to come to grips with. That's what I'm doing when I'm when I'm making electronic music. And I think because I played in kind of like quite an electro pop band for a really long time and, and wrote as a part of that project. I, n- I never looked at it. I always looked at it as songwriting as opposed to composition. And then, you know, when I started doing more composition work that was just electronic and uh, it's just something that I've had to, I've had to adapt to the fact that, you know, you can call yourself a composer now and, and it's quite a nice. I've, quite a nice I've never seen a difference really. I mean, it's just what, whatever word you, you, I mean, I know a lot, a lot of youngsters call it pr- uh, production now. And of course, because I'm a bit older, I, I see production as, as like a film director. So, you know, you're steering what someone else has done. But I mean, I honestly, I don't, I never mind what, what word one uses. I mean, I certainly know, I, I play keys in a, in, a, in a rock and roll band at the uh, Super Excels, and we do, we do our own stuff, but we do a lot of um, kind of classic 70s and 80s uh, rock covers. So a lot of Bowie. Um, a lot of electro pops, so we do, you know, some Gary Newman and 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 uh, uh, that, that kind of stuff. And certainly, uh, they're non-readers, um, and so I'll do lead sheets as um, literally just a um, like a spreadsheet with the, with the, with a chord uh, a chord name and a color. And what you you very quickly get a sense of is that fine these are three four minute songs but composition in the sense of the the structuring and the organization of blocks of sound is absolutely as much of songwriting as it is of a uh i know a bach in prelude or or, or a, a symphony or, or, or a, uh, an opera it's just on a, on a different scale so the idea of having a material a different material the old material back again, but this time it's shorter or it's longer. All of those are compositional decisions. Um, the only thing that differs really is principally the time scale. You know, you're talking a, a few minutes or a, or a couple of hours, and the, the the sort of tonal context of of what of what an audience is going to expect, given that it's a rock and roll band or a string quartet or a, an orchestra or, or whatever but no definitely I mean uh, uh, whatever you're doing you're 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 composing I mean you're the, if you're doing music concrete and 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 you're writing with little bits of, of of tape or whatever you're composing because you're making decisions about the order that those sounds are supposed to come in and fine I mean they, they, they can be trained sounds right famously with the the etude de chemin de fer uh the, the Pierre Schaffer piece but what he's doing with those train materials is exactly the same thing you would do with string sounds or or instrumental sounds or whatever it's just the sounds are different but you're still organizing them you're still making decisions about them and something like stochastic is 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 allowing you to make the same kinds of decisions it's just it's doing some of the legwork of actually producing the, the, the pitches, but you're still saying, okay, we're going to go over here for a while, and now we're going to go over here for a while, and now we're going to get faster, and now we're going to get slower. That's what you do when you when you play. Yeah, definitely. Do you know, do you know what, Finn? I, I, I'm so glad that you agreed to, to talk to me today. I, I've learned loads from you anyway, and you're just a fascinating <laughs> human being. In, in, oh. You know... I definitely, if I had more, if I had more free time, I'd definitely be signed up to one of your courses as well. Um, oh, well. But yeah, but yeah you, you, I, I definitely would. I definitely appreciate you coming on, and I, I think that I'd definitely like to speak to you again in the future about some other topics. I think that. Uh, I 
you know, we're, we're here to talk about your module today, but I, I'd like to just talk to you quite regularly about music, I think. I think you're wow. <laughs> very kind of you. And I think well, look, people will get you, a lot from this. Well, likewise, I mean, I, I, I think what you're doing is, is, is fascinating. I'd love to hear some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the modular stuff that you're doing, but also the non-modular stuff as well. So to kind of get a context of, 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 of how the two are, are sort of in, interacting in your musical life. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that the the modular is going to creep more into, you know, my more traditional background, I think, definitely, as I've, uh, I, I kind of, I got into modular as a passion project, and, and I've always performed under Maven Fiction with the band, and then I had, not to boil my life story, but I had a, a quite a big operation on my throat um, about 18 months ago, and I, could, I couldn't sing for a really long time, so during that during that period i i just got into other means of making music and different means of composition if you like and during that time that's where i kind of got stuck into modular and then bizarrely i was saying on i was on the colorado modular society sort of monthly meetup on sunday and they you know they were asking you know tell us a little bit about yourself and and i just said it's just bizarre really that i've always made sort of content to support the marketing of of my music and then because the the modular community is is relatively niche and small but really inviting and and a set type of people that it mm-hmm. and and they're really welcoming and stuff and it's just bizarre that already you know i was just getting invited to speak on on a panel like that which which just seemed bizarre when, when i've only really owned <laughs> modular for <laughs> 18 months but it was really flattering and really nice <laughs> It's not so bizarre because, I mean, you, you speak incredibly eloquently about it, so you're clearly very, very knowledgeable about it. And I think that your, your, the particular position that you're coming from as a, as, as a, a, a player of tr- traditional instruments and from a, a, a completely different genre, I, th- I think it's a very, it's a very welcoming community. Team. That's something that, that 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 I think is clear to anybody who goes to super booth or, or goes onto a forum or something like that. It's a very egalitarian one in that there are people from all kinds of different backgrounds. You know, from, from DJs to composers to performance artists to visual artists who are doing you know mo- modular visuals and things like that. So um, I, I, I'm not surprised they asked you at all. I, you, 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 you've got huge amounts to say and huge amounts to bring to it. So I'm. I, I'm thrilled that they did, and I, I, I'm really glad that that um, you're bringing your ideas to this because I think it's, I think it's fascinating. Thank you very much. That's kind of you. It's, kind of, it's not it's not why I invited you today, but it, it's always nice <laughs> to receive those compliments. So I'll t- you can definitely come back now. <laughs> well, yeah, no. So I guess. Normally we'd talk about what's next, but we've kind of covered that, and we we we're not allowed to know yet. Um, which definitely well, top secret. It, yeah. It's something that that I mean, you know, lo- loads of people are, are kind enough to 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 ask us and be be kind of interested in in in, in what we're going to do, and that's that's amazing too. And and the 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 support and good feeling and not least patience. Um, that everybody has had about this because you know some people have been on that list for a long time and have stuck with it and been enormously supportive and kind of realized that it's it's difficult to, heaven's sakes incorporate I think we, we, we incorporated a couple of days after Brexit and so you know there's Brexit there's the pandemic there's the semiconductor shortage and you know all of these other things that where real life is sort of intervenes and people have been so tremendously understanding of that and so supportive of the project. Um, the, you know, that, that's been really touching and that's meant an awful lot to, to, to myself and, and, and Stuart as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I, lots of people are asking what's coming next. And I, I, Stuart and I are, are, are kind of bursting to say, but it's, it, it's, I mean, it won't be next week uh, because we've got a lot of work to do to, to, uh, to make it work. But, the really important point is that we're not just um, a, a one product company. We were born out of a product through through kind of the uh, the necessity of uh, um, of Omsonic not being able to to get them out. So that's that certainly was the catalyst for us. 
but um, yeah, uh, SI I think is, is 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 going to be um, a sort of umbrella term for for lots of modules which are doing this kind of idea, this exploring performative process, plus a few other things as well. I mean, it, 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 I think it won't all be probabilistic stuff, but um, we, we've we've got you know a, a couple of quite big modules that, that, that we've got in the planning and, and a few smaller ones. Um, I mean, probably one I can talk about because it's, it's sort of already out there was the other one that I did with, uh, with Fenner on Sonic, which was strange, which you can actually see just plumbed in next to uh, Stochastic there. Um, the, uh, I think Fenn did a small run of those and uh, a, a, a few people got those and, and, and I noticed on Mod Wiggler a couple of people were, were talking about a, a strange. Um, so strange is probably something we will re revisit um, in the not too distant future. Maybe do a kind of upgraded version of that. Um, but uh, yeah, that that too, it's, it's of course not as performative as as uh, Sig is. But it, it it was taking the idea of um, a, a, what would a random source be that you could steer rather than just set into motion. So um, although it hasn't got, it's not individual note sliders or something like that, you can at least kind of tell it where you want it to move and where you, kind of where you want it to be random and how random you want it to be. Um, so uh, yes, watch, watch this space as they say. Yeah, I'm, exci I'm excited for you to solve problems that I didn't even know I had yet. That's what I'm really excited because <laughs> that's what this module's done. And talking to you today, I can tell that that's that's what's going to happen. And so, and it's really good. And and now another thing that I've learned today is whenever I do something really stupid, I've got the excuse of my brain did it far before I knew that I was yes. going to do that stupid yes. thing. And that's going to come. That's going to come in really, really useful. I imagine because I'm, I'm quite. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so yeah thanks again and like i say we'll, we'll definitely be speaking again so i, I look forward to it and th like, thanks for That's teaching one... me as much as you've taught me Been oh that would be completely mutual but you're very kind thank you and thank you once again for the wonderful opportunity it's been great no it's great I i'll stick all your links will be below you know i know that obviously at the moment you're dealing with with a backlog but um, when you can, when these do become available again, I'd encourage people to go get one, so I'll stick that below. I think you've just froze right at this very last moment as well, but it's probably a good time anyway. So, thank you, if you can hear me, and I'll uh, speak to you soon.